land in some way, and he's now frustrated. Let's put it in our notes. Notice how everything is turning, right? That is to say, notice the change that's going on. For Pahom, now he is a landowner. Different responsibilities when you're a landowner, frustrating him. So we'll see now how he has to engage the peasants, of which, of course, he once was one fully. Finally, he decided it must be Simon. No one else could have done it. So he went to Simon's homestead to have a look around, but he found nothing and only had an angry scene. However, he now felt more certain than ever that Simon had done it, and he lodged a complaint. Simon was summoned. The case was tried and retried, and at the end of it all, Simon was acquitted, there being no evidence against him. 343. Pahom felt still more aggrieved and let his anger loose upon the elders and the judges. You let thieves grease your palms, said he. If you were honest folk yourselves, you wouldn't let a thief go free. So Pahom quarreled with the judges and with his neighbors. Threats to burn his hut began to be uttered. So though Pahom had more land, his place in the community was much worse than before. Key line, right? About this time, a rumor got about that many people were moving to new parts. There's no need for me to leave my land, thought Pahom. But some of the others may leave our village, and then there'd be more room for us. I'd take over their land myself and make my estates somewhat bigger. I could then live more at ease. As it is, I'm still too cramped to be comfortable. One day Pahom was sitting at home when a peasant passing through the village happened to drop in. He was allowed to stay the night, and supper was given him. Pahom had a talk with this peasant and asked him where he came from. The stranger answered that he came from beyond the Volga, where he had been working. One word led to another, and the man went on to say that many people were settling in those parts. He told how some people from his village had settled there. They had joined the community there and had had 25 acres per man granted them. The land was so good, he said, that the rye sown on it grew as high as a horse and so thick that five cuts of a sickle made a sheaf. One peasant, he said, had brought nothing with him but his bare hands, and now he had six horses and two cows of his own. Pahom's heart kindled with desire. Kindled with Why desire. Why suffer in this narrow hole if one can live so well elsewhere, he thought. I'll sell my land and my homestead here, and with the money I'll start afresh over there and get everything new. In this crowded place, one is always having trouble. But I must first go and find out all about it myself. Towards summer, he got ready and started out. He went down the Volga on a steamer to Samara, then walked another 300 miles on foot, and at last reached the place. It was just as the stranger had said. The peasants had plenty of land. Every man had 25 acres of communal land given him for his use, and anyone who had money could buy besides, at a ruble and a half an acre, as much good freehold land as he wanted. Having found out all he wished to know, Pahom returned home as autumn came on, and he began selling off his belongings. He sold his land at a profit, sold his homestead and all his cattle, and withdrew from membership in the village. He only waited till the spring, and then started with his family for the new settlement. All right, let's pause at the conclusion now of part number three, the evolution of our story. Notice two things about this section. One, owning land causes him problems because people who don't own land end up on his land messing with him and he's got to deal with them and he even makes accusations. They end up being false accusations. He even gets in fights with the judges themselves. Number two, somebody, a stranger, shows up and says, dude, I know another place where you can get land. Notice that he goes to visit. Hey, did you notice this? It's an interesting little brief comment that might get lost, except for later in the story it's going to come back. He walks, notice, on uh, page 343. He, he finally gets a steamer to Samara, and then we're told he walks 300 miles on foot at last. To reach this place, whoa, let's put it in our notes, he's incredibly motivated to get more land. He wants more land. And sure enough, he's willing again to sacrifice everything, to risk everything to get the land. He sells off everything. Whoa, he's going to go 
to get more land. Of course, as he's doing this, maybe he's even going to get wealthier, right? All right, let's go to section number four, which begins on 344, finishes on 346. So again, like we've said before, really try and concentrate. Notice how we're reading section by section so that we can stay alert to what's actually going on in the story. All right, I wonder what's going to happen to our hero next. As soon as Pahom and his family reached their new abode, he applied for admission into the council of a large village. He stood treat to the elders and obtained the necessary documents. Five shares of communal land were given him for his own and his son's use. That is to say, 125 acres, not all together, but in different fields, besides the use of the communal pasture. Pahom put up the buildings he needed and bought cattle. Of the communal land alone, he had three times as much as at his former home, and the land was good wheat land. He was ten times better off than he had been. He had plenty of arable land and pasturage, and could keep as many head of cattle as he liked. At first, in the bustle of building and settling down, Pahom was pleased with it all. But when he got used to it, he began to think that even here he hadn't enough land. The first year he sowed wheat on his share of the communal land and had a good crop. He wanted to go on sowing wheat, but had not enough communal land for the purpose, and what he had already used was not available, for in those parts wheat is sown only on virgin soil or on fallow land. It is sown for one or two years, and then the land lies fallow till it is again overgrown with steppe grass. There were many who wanted such land, and there was not enough for all so that people quarreled about it. Those who were better off wanted it for growing wheat, and those who were poor wanted it to let to dealers, so that they might raise money to pay their taxes. Pahom wanted to sow more wheat, so he rented land from a dealer for a year. He sowed much wheat and had a fine crop, but the land was too far from the village. The wheat had to be carted more than ten miles. After a time, Pahom noticed that some peasant dealers were living on separate farms and were growing wealthy. And he thought, if I were to buy some freehold land and have a homestead on it, it would be a different thing altogether. Then it would all be fine and close together. The question of buying freehold land recurred to him again and again. He went on in the same way for three years, renting land and sowing wheat. The seasons turned out well and the crops were good, so that he began to lay by money. He might have gone on living contentedly, but he grew tired of having to rent other people's land every year and having to scramble for it. Wherever there was good land to be had, the peasants would rush for it, and it was taken up at once, so that unless you were sharp about it, you got none. 345. It happened in the third year that he and a dealer together rented a piece of pasture land from some peasants and they had already plowed it up when there was some dispute and the peasants went to law about it and things fell out so that the labor was all lost. If it were my own land, thought Pahom, I should be independent and there wouldn't be all this unpleasantness. So Pahom began looking out for land which he could buy and he came across a peasant who had bought 1,300 acres but having got into difficulties, was willing to sell again cheap. Pahom bargained and haggled with him, and at last they settled the price at 1,500 rubles, part in cash and part to be paid later. They had all but clinched the matter when a passing dealer happened to stop at Pahom's one day to get feed for his horses. He drank tea with Pahom, and they had a talk. The dealer said that he was just returning from the land of the Bashkirs, far away, where he had bought 13,000 acres of land, all for a thousand rubles. Pahom questioned him further, and the dealer said, All one has to do is to make friends with the chiefs. I gave away about 100 rubles worth of silk robes and carpets, besides a case of tea, and I gave wine to those who would drink it, and I got the land for less than three kopecks an acre and he showed Pahom the title deed, saying, The land lies near a river, and the whole steppe is virgin soil. Pahom plied him with questions, and the dealer said, There's more land there than you could cover if you walked a year, and it all belongs to the Bashkirs. They're as simple as sheep, and land can be got almost for nothing. There now, thought Pahom, with my 1,000 rubles, why should I get only 1,300 acres, 
and saddle myself with a debt besides. If I take it out there, I can get more than ten times as much for my money. All right, let's pause. Write it down. What happens in this section? Well, two things. One, you're beginning to see a pattern, I hope. One, he gets more land. He becomes more profitable. He becomes more wealthy. And, we should say, he becomes more happy because he's getting the thing he wanted. That is to say, more land. Two, a stranger shows up and tells him about a, a way that he can pick up more land with these Bashirs way out in another place. And of course, the key line at line three, or on page 346, the key line, there's more land there than you could cover if you walked a year, and it all belongs to the Bashkirs. They're as simple as sheep, and the land can be got almost for nothing. And of course, now part five, section five, we're ready to keep going. This whole notion of, can I get more land? Obviously, the title begins to make sense, right? Can I get more land? Can I get more land? By the way, this notion of being content with what you've got is already a major theme that you may want to write down in 2A, right? The idea of how can you ever be ultimately content? Let's continue. Pahom inquired how to get to the place, and as soon as the grain dealer had left him, he prepared to go there himself. He left his wife to look after the homestead and started on his journey, his journey. taking his hired man with him. They stopped at a town on their way and bought a case of tea, some wine, and other presents, as the grain dealer had advised. 347. On and on they went, until they had gone more than 300 miles, and on the seventh day they came to a place where the Bashkirs had pitched their round tents. It was all just as the dealer had said. The people lived on the steppe, by a river, in felt-covered tents. They neither tilled the ground nor ate bread. Their cattle and horses grazed in herds on the steppe. The colts were tethered behind the tents, and the mares were driven to them twice a day. The mares were milked, and from the milk, kumis was made. It was the women who prepared the kumis, and they also made cheese. As far as the men were concerned, drinking kumis and tea, eating mutton, and playing on their pipes was all they cared about. They were all stout and merry, and all the summer long they never thought of doing any work. They were quite ignorant and knew no Russian, but were good-natured enough. As soon as they saw Pahom, they came out of their tents and gathered around the visitor. An interpreter was found, and Pahom told them he had come about some land. The Bashkirs seemed very glad. They took Pahom and led him into one of the best tents, where they made him sit on some down cushions placed on a carpet, while they sat around him. They gave him some tea and kumis and had a sheep killed and gave him mutton to eat. Pahom took presents out of his cart and distributed them among the Bashkirs and divided the tea amongst them. The Bashkirs were delighted. They talked a great deal among themselves and then told the interpreter what to say. They wish to tell you, said the interpreter, that they like you and that it's our custom to do all we can to please a guest and to repay him for his gifts. You have given us presents. Now tell us which of the things we possess please you best, that we may present them to you. What pleases me best here and... Yeah, you can guess, right? In other words, he shows up. Notice these Bashirs. Notice the life they live. Write it down. They, they enjoy life, right? They're not constantly worrying about other things. And they bring him in. By the way, from our freshman study of the Odyssey, remember we call this Zania, showing hospitality. They show him Zania, they show him hospitality. And then they say to him, you gave us some presents, what would you like in return? You can predict, obviously, what it is that he's going to ask for in return, because they got all this land, right? Here we go. Answer Pahom, is your land. Our land is crowded, and the soil is worn out. But you have plenty of land, and it is good land. I never saw the likes of it. The interpreter told the Bashkirs what Pahom had said. They talked among themselves for a while. Pahom could not understand what they were saying, but saw that they were much amused and heard them shout and laugh. Then they were silent and looked at Pahom while the interpreter said, They wish me to tell you that in return for your presence they will gladly give you as much land as you want. You have only to point it out with your hand and it is yours. 348. The Bashkirs talked again for a while and began to dispute. Pahom asked what they were disputing about, 
and the interpreter told him that some of them thought they ought to ask their chief about the land and not act in his absence, while others thought there was no need to wait for his return. All right, so here we go. Let's sit, put it in our notes, the section five. So the, the discussion is, okay, they, they're ready to give him the land, and yet there's some debate about whether they should wait or not. Notice they laugh while they're talking, but Pahum doesn't know exactly what's going on. Section six, a brief section that will now begin to take us to the end of the story and, of course, the central conflict of the story. While the Bashkirs were disputing, a man in a large fox fur cap appeared on the scene. They all became silent and rose to their feet. The chief, right? The interpreter said, this is our chief himself. Pahom immediately fetched the best dressing gown and five pounds of tea and offered these to the chief. The chief accepted them and seated himself in the place of honor. The Bashkirs at once began telling him something. The chief listened for a while then made a sign with his head for them to be silent, and addressing himself to Pahom, said in Russian, Well, so be it. Choose whatever piece of land you like. We have plenty of it. How can I take as much as I like, thought Pahom. I must get a deed to make it secure, or else they may say, It is yours, and afterward may take it away again. Thank you for your kind words, he said aloud. You have much land, and I only want a little but I should like to be sure which portion is mine. Could it not be measured and made over to me? Life and death are in God's hands. You good people give it to me, but your children might wish to take it back again. You are quite right, said the chief. We will make it over to you. I heard that a dealer had been here, continued Pahom, and that you gave him a little land too and signed title deeds to that effect. I should like to have it done in the same way. The chief understood. Yes, replied he, that can be done quite easily. We have a scribe, and we will go to town with you and have the deed properly sealed. And what will be the price? asked Pahom. Our price is always the same, 1,000 rubles a day. Pahom did not understand. A day? What measure is that? How many acres would that be? We do not know how to reckon it out, said the chief. We sell it by the day. As much as you can go around on your feet in a day is yours, and the price is 1,000 rubles a day. Pahom was surprised. But in a day you can get around a large tract of land, he said. The chief laughed. It will all be yours, said he, but there is one condition. If you don't return on the same day to the spot whence you started, your money is lost. 349. Like to mark the way that I have gone. Why, we shall go to any spot you like and stay there. You must start from that spot and make your round, taking a spade with you. Wherever you think necessary, make a mark. At every turning, dig a hole and pile up the turf. Then afterward, we will go around with a plow from hole to hole. You may make as large a circuit as you please, but before the sun sets, you must return to the place you started from. All the land you cover will be yours. Pahom was delighted. It was decided to start early next morning. They talked a while, and after drinking some more kumis and eating some more mutton, they had tea again, and then the night came on. They gave Pahom a feather bed to sleep on, and the Bashkirs dispersed for the night, promising to assemble the next morning at daybreak and ride out before sunrise to the appointed spot. All right, let's pause. Here are the rules to the, can we say, the game. And it's a pretty interesting game. In other words, here it is. You want land, this is how you get land. You have one day to walk as far as you want to walk. We're going to have you start at a spot. You're going to dig a, a plant, a, a marker, and then you start walking. You get an entire day. You go for a walk. Every time you get to a spot, you like wherever you are, dig a hole, create the place for your spot, and then keep walking. And... Here's the only condition. By the end of the day, you have to return to the spot that you started from. Now, of course, here we are in the heart of the story in section six, yes. And this is the essence of the question. Will he be able to get his land? The answer is 
Sure. We know how far he can walk. Two times in our story he's walked how many miles? 300 miles. Yes? So we know this guy can walk. And he's been told, however far you can walk in one day, that's how much land you're going to get. Let's pause for a moment, have a little bit of a conversation, jot down in your notes. What do you think is going to happen next in this story? Take a little break.